Okay, so chapter 12 was on solids. Chapter 13 is on liquids. And I bet you can guess what chapter 14 will be on. So, I want to start by defining pressure. In equation form, pressure is force divided by area. So, for example, if this brick is lying on the table, it's pushing down on the table with some force. But that force is spread over some area. So there's a pressure pushing down. If you tilt the brick up, it's the same brick, so with the same weight, so the same force will be pressed over a smaller area. So it will have a greater, uh, greater pressure. And pressure is what causes pain. So if you really want to increase the pressure, you can decrease area to the head of a pin. And then even with a small force, you'll get a very high pressure and it will hurt. So basically, pressure depends on the area over which the force is distributed. Its units are newtons per meter squared, which is the same thing as a pascal. One pascal equals one newton per meter squared. In a liquid, pressure depends on the depth, but not the volume of the liquid. So for example, if you swim down to the bottom of a large but shallow lake, uh, there'll be some pressure, but it'll be twice as much if you swim down to the bottom of a small but very, very deep pond, because it only depends on depth. Pressure acts equally outwards in all directions. So if you squeeze a bag of water with holes in it, the pressure forces the water out of these holes at right angles to the surface of the bag. Uh, if you tilt your head underwater, it doesn't matter uh, what direction you tip your head, pressure is the same. The bottom of a boat uh, will be pushed upwards by water pressure. Similarly, pressure acts upward when pushing the bottom of a beach ball. So if you consider something that's immersed in water, there will be pressure pushing inwards on all sides, and that will cause an apparent loss of weight called buoyancy. So the buoyancy force is a net upward force due to pressure. And it, it equal, its amount equals the amount of equals the weight of the water displaced. So the displacement rule is that a completely submerged object always displaces a volume of liquid equal to its own volume. For example, if you have a container that was filled to the brim with water, and then you dip the stone in the water the amount, and carefully measure how much water spills out, this displaced water will have a volume equal to the volume of this rock. So the buoyancy force is a net upward force that equals the water, the weight of the water displaced. And this net force does not depend on, on the depth. It's just a difference. So for this block, it's, it doesn't, doesn't have much pressure around it, but it would have two newtons pushing on the bottom, one newton pressing on the top, and so the net force would be one newton upwards. The pressure keeps increasing as you go down, so the, the, pressure, the force is three newtons on the top surface of this block, but it'll be four newtons on the bottom surface of this block, and if you do four minus three, again, the net force is, uh, is one newton upwards. So in about 250 BC, Archimedes uh, discovered a principle which relates buoyancy to the displaced liquid. And it states that an, Im an immersed body is buoyed up by a force that equals the weight of the fluid it displaces. And this applies to both gases and liquids. And there's a famous story that Archimedes discovered this when he got into a bathtub and pushed the, uh, displaced a certain amount of water and he shouted, Eureka! So a consequence of Archimedes' principle is the, the apparent weight of a submerged object is less. It's equal to its weight out of the water minus this buoyancy force. For example, here you have a three newton block which gets submerged in some water and pushes out two newtons worth of water. The apparent weight of that block now is three minus two, so equals one newton. And that's why you feel lighter when you get into the swimming pool. The principle of flotation is that a floating object always displaces a weight of fluid 
equal to its own weight. So, for example, if you have a block of iron, a one ton block of iron, it does not displace one ton of water because iron is more dense than water, so it just sinks to the bottom. However, if you make that iron into the shape of a great big bowl and then dip it into the water, then a whole big volume of air will displace some water. And when there's, if there's one ton worth of water displaced, then the buoyancy force will, will be equal to the weight of the iron, and you can float your boat. Another consequence of Archimedes' principle is that denser fluids will exert a greater buoyant force on a body than a less dense fluid. So salt water is more dense than fresh water, and that's why salt water pushes pushes upward. So here's a man floating in the Dead Sea, which is very, very salty water. And so he can even read a newspaper without anything holding him up except just his own buoyancy. Archimedes' principle also applies in air. The more air an object displaces, the greater the buoyancy force on it. And if it displaces the amount of air of the whole weight of the balloon, then it can hover at a constant altitude. And if you shrink this balloon, it will descend. So whether an object floats or sinks depends on the weight of the object and the weight of the fluid displaced, and the difference between those two weights. Now the weight of the fluid that's displaced depends on the volume that it's displacing. So what really counts is the weight of the object per volume, and that's related to the average density of the object. So the average density of this rubber duck is less than the, the density of water, and that's why the duck always floats. So the rule is that an object more dense than the fluid will sink, like this anchor. An object that's less dense than the fluid will float, like a piece of wood. And an object having a density equal to the density of the fluid will just hover at whatever height it already is at, like this fish. Pascal's principle states that a change in pressure at any point uh, in a fluid is transmitted to every other part of that fluid. So if you were to press downward on this column of water, then that would press a force upward on this, this part of the column of water. So here's a hydraulic press. You have liquid in, in a pipe which is connected to a larger area pipe, pipe with 50 times the area. The pressure will be transmitted from here to here and will be the same. But since the area is twice as great here, then that same pressure will, will produce a force which is 50 times greater. And that is how a hydraulic press can lift up a heavy car. So a 10 kilogram load uh, lifts a 500 kilogram uh, load on, on the other large piston. Surface tension. The contractive tendency of the surface of liquids is called surface tension. So if you submerge a wire in water and pull it out, it turns out the spring will stretch just a little more just as the wire emerges from the water. If you take a paintbrush and pull it out, the water will contract and pull all the hairs together. Other examples include little drops. Uh, any droplet of water will tend to form a sphere because uh, that's the shape having the least surface area per given volume. And bubbles form the same way. It's due to surface tension. Surface tension is caused by the attraction of molecules in the, in the liquid to each other. So beneath the surface, every molecule is attracted to all its neighbors, and so the net force is zero. But at the surface, there's no neighbors above, but there's neighbors below, and so there's a net pull downwards. And that's what causes the surface tension. This gives rise to capil capillarity. So the water molecules will adhere to the glass walls of a tube and that will cause will allow surface tension to draw the water up a tube as it show, as shown here in C. The liquid will raise up until the surface tension that's pulling it upwards balances the weight of this column of water. So the height of this rise depends on the weight of the liquid and the narrowness of the tube. As you get smaller and smaller tubes capillarity will uh, bring that liquid up to a higher height.
examples of capillarity is oil rising in a wick. So here's an oil lamp where you just dip the wick in there and the oil comes up and it burns. If you let long hair dangle down into a bathtub, capillarity will pull that water up until your scalp gets wet. And capillarity is also how a lot of trees um, will draw water from the roots up to the rest of the tree.